Following a battle between the Hebrews and the Philistines, the prophet Samuel raised a stone memorial between the towns of Mizpah and Shin. He named the stone Ebenezer, or the Lord has helped us. You'll find this phrase in our opening hymn, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, found in the back of your today's bulletin. Stand as you're able and sing together. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Dear God, today our theme must be help. Jonah called out for help. We cry out for your help. And like Samuel who raised the stone he named Ebenezer, thanking you for your help, we come thanking you for our help. Because we tend to wander and are prone to leave you on the back burner of our lives, today we thank you for your unconditional love, your parental guidance, and of course, your generous help. Give us strength and intelligence to turn from worshiping vain idols in our secular world and instead spend our energies serving you who provided us a savior divine, the Lamb of Calvary, our Ebenezer, in whose name we pray, amen. Good morning and welcome to worship at First Baptist Church. Today is the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. If you're our guest in worship this morning, we welcome you and invite you to fill out the form, which is in the back side of your program. Uh, it, you scan it. Uh, well, if you fill this out, you turn this in as you leave in the narthex as a basket. Uh, if you prefer to do it electronically, where there's a QR code in the front inside cover and a QR code in the backside cover. 
same one. Uh, we appreciate you filling this out because it's a gift to us. And it gives us an opportunity to thank you for your participation in worship today. Whether you're present in the sanctuary or worshiping at home with us, we welcome you to this sacred and holy time. Our hope is that you sense the presence of God here in this place as we worship as a community of faith. Now, we welcome our children today and invite them to come to the front and you'll find on the floor a blue dot on which you can sit while you visit for a few moments with Dr. David. Good morning, everybody. It is good to see everybody here today. I hope you're having a good day. Normally, I have a small box, but today I have a much bigger box because what I have to share with you is so much larger that it wouldn't fit in the box that I normally bring. So let me ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself in need of help? I mean, you know, the kind of help that, you know, you need somebody else to help you with, that you think you know what's going on, but really, when it comes down to it, you don't really have a clue. Well, to be honest with you, I find myself in that situation far more often than I want to. And what I have in my box today is a reminder to me of a time that that happened to me, and I want to share it with you. So let me open my box. Let me open my box. And pull this out. It's heavy. How's that? This is a jack. And you use a jack to jack up a car and change the tire. Well, when I was learning to drive, my dad told me that there were some things I needed to know about a car. And one of those things was how to change a tire. Well, this isn't the jack that I used to learn how to change a tire. Back in the day, a long time ago, they had a jack that would fit to the end of a bumper. And you would jack the car up and the bumper would go up with the car. Today, if you tried to do that, the bumper would just fall off because it's not that kind of a bumper. But back when I was learning to drive, they had a bumper jack. So my dad told me how to do it. And then he waited a couple of weeks and said, okay, it's your turn to do it all by yourself. So I went outside and I put the jack under the car and I got the car up. I was so excited. And then I couldn't get the car down. And he told me about a little lever on the car, on the jack, that if you press the lever, the jack would go down. Well, I did that, but the jack started going up again. So when he came home, he said, what's the problem? The car looks great up, but can you get the car down? And I said, no, I can't. So then he said, let me show you how to do it. So he flipped the little lever, just like I did, and he pressed the handle, and the car jack went up. And I said, just like me. But what I didn't know is, then it would go down. He pressed it again, it went up, and down, up and down lower, and down lower, till finally the car hit the ground again. I thought I knew what I was doing, but I didn't. And you know, that is the same thing that's going on in our Bible story today. You see, Jonah thought he knew all that God wanted him to do, but he didn't. Jonah found himself in the belly of a whale, in a big mess, just like I was in a big mess trying to get the car jack down. 
So I thought I knew what I was doing. So did Jonah. I found myself in a big mess, just like Jonah. But one of the things that happened was Jonah decided to pray. And so he prayed to God, and eventually the big fish in which Jonah found himself spewed him out on dry land, and Jonah then started doing what God wanted him to do. It was a long roundabout way, but Jonah finally got there. Same thing happened to me. I spent a long time trying to get that car down, but with help from my father, just like Jonah had help from his father, the heavenly father from God, he eventually started doing what God wanted him to do. And so we're thankful for that. I'm thankful that my dad was able to help me. And one of the things that God wants us to understand is that God is always near, willing to lend a hand. So let's pray to God and thank God for always being near us, okay? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for car jacks and the ability to change a tire. But we more importantly thank you for who you are and your ability to help us. Thank you for helping us realize that we are always in need of you. And help us to understand that even this week. For it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Before you leave today, I have something special for you. You cannot talk about Jonah and the big fish without what? Exactly. Goldfish crackers. So here you go. The Lord be with you. From time to time, someone will ask me what my favorite Bible verse is. It's hard for a pastor to pick just one. But probably most of the time, I will say Romans 8, 28. For we know that God is at work for good in all things to those who love the Lord and are called according to God's purpose. One of the ways that that promise has been powerfully fulfilled in the life of First Baptist Church is the Craig Holbrook Parham Scholarship. After Craig's untimely death at the age of 27, memorials poured into our church. In the providence of God, and in the spirit-led discernment of the Parham family and the First Baptist Church family, the Craig Holbrook Parham Scholarship was born. Since 1986, First Baptist Church has awarded more than 640 scholarships to college, seminary, and divinity school students who are preparing for ministry. And those scholarships total more than $350,000. The numbers are impressive. But even more striking is that each number represents a person, a calling, a journey toward ministry. This year, First Baptist Church is awarding Parham scholarships to eight students including our own Mary Frances Thompson. The names and schools of all the recipients are listed in your order of worship or on your video screen. We want to pray for these students as part of our worship this morning, and I hope that you'll pray for them throughout this school year. Would you join me as we pray together? Good and gracious God, you have given us so much to be thankful for. In this moment, we especially thank you for the life of our brother in Christ, Craig Holbrook Parham, 
and for the joyous memories which dwell in the minds and hearts of those who knew and loved him. We thank you for the generosity of those who have given to this scholarship, endowment, and memory of Craig, and for the oversight and generosity of his family in this ongoing ministry of First Baptist Church. We thank you for the women and men whom you have called to ministry and who benefit from these scholarships. We ask your rich blessings for these ministers. Use their education to prepare them and equip them for the work that they will do in the name and love of Jesus. Let their lives and our lives reflect your great love in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christian disciples worship, Christian disciples serve, and Christian disciples give. We come to the time now that we pray for the gifts and offerings that come from God through First Baptist Church. We know that by giving we support not only the mission of this church, but the ministries of our two dozen missions partners. So we thank you for your gifts. You can give today by leaving your gift in the basket on the narthex, in the narthex, or you can give securely online by scanning the QR code in the order of worship or on your video screen, or by going to our church's website. Beth Hartage, our Deacon of the Week, will come now and lead us in our offertory prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, you are the giver of all good things, and your word makes clear that every good and perfect gift comes from you. We ask that you accept these gifts and use them to your glory. May these gifts bring shelter for the homeless, comfort to the sick, rest to the weary, and hope to the hopeless. We pray that you would multiply these, our offerings, to you and accomplish with them much more than we could ask or imagine. All we have is yours, Father, and we ask that you would use us and all we have as you will. Amen.
As we are gathered here today, we remember Joanne Fennell as she continues to recover itself, and the family of Ralph McDaniel, who is the great-grandfather of Cody Beard. And now, if you will please join me in our prayers of the people. Lord, you are a God of our highest highs and our lowest lows. We praise you when we succeed and cry out for you when we despair. Help us to remember your presence in these times. Do not let feelings of elation sweep us away and prevent us from remembering your help. But also do not let overwhelming darkness keep us from finding you. Let us seek you always. Lord, in your mercy. As a new wave of coronavirus cases come and the Delta variant fills us with apprehension, we pray for your wisdom and guidance, O Lord. We pray not only for ourselves, but also for our leaders. May they continue to make wise decisions, not based on popularity, but what's best for everyone. Give discernment to us all. Lord, in your mercy. But we also remember that there is more than just leaders in this world. Give us patience and grace as we remember everyone is struggling. Let us be kind to one another as you would have us do anyway. Let us find each moment and ways that we can remember the greater story that others are a part of and find new ways to show them your love and kindness. Lord, in your mercy. And now take a moment as we gather up our individual thoughts and prayers in a moment of gathered silence. Lord, in your mercy. And now we pray the way that you taught your disciples to pray all those years ago. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue in our series from the life of Jonah this morning. The text which can be found in your order of worship is from Jonah chapter 2. And then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And then I said, I am driven away from your sight. How shall I again look upon your holy temple? The waters closed in over me. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. And yet, you brought up my life from the pit, O oh Lord my God. As my life was ebbing away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who worship vain idols forsake their true loyalty, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. And then... The Lord spoke to the fish, and it spewed Jonah out upon the dry land. This is the word of God for our time 
and our lives. Thanks be to God. so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Amen. There's an old story about a woman who is riding a city bus and she's reading her Bible. And across the aisle from her is a man who looks at her and says, you don't really believe all of that stuff in the Bible, do you? And she says, well, yes, I do. He says, how can you believe some of that stuff? Like that story about Jonah. How can a person live in the belly of a fish for three days and survive? She says, well, I don't know. I guess when I get to heaven, I'll just have to ask Jonah. He says sarcastically, well, what if Jonah's not in heaven? She says, then you can ask him. At the end of this morning's text, we find Jonah lying on the shore, having just been spewed out by the fish. He looks rough. He's weak and dehydrated because he hasn't had anything to eat or drink for three days. For three days, he hasn't changed clothes 
or even bathe, sort of like some of the boys I've taken to church camp over the years. But most of all, Jonah looks rough because, as the King James translates very accurately, the fish vomited him out. Which means, how should one say, Jonah is not the only thing to come up out of the stomach of the fish. Since you're going somewhere to eat lunch immediately after this service, you'll notice how delicately I'm telling this story. Not dwelling on a lot of unnecessary detail, but just hitting the high points. The bottom line is Jonah has looked better on most days in his lifetime, but His lifetime isn't over. That's the remarkable thing. Here is a man who is barely alive, but he is alive. Clearly, Jonah didn't think he was going to survive his ordeal in the fish. In verse 4, he says, I will never see the Lord's temple again. He thinks he's going to die. Verse 5, the waters have closed in over me. This is going to be my grave. Verse 6, I've come to the place where the bars have closed in upon me forever. Jonah was taught that terrible theology, which says if you obey God, God will pour out riches and blessings on you. But if you disobey God, God will let you have it. So Jonah thinks, this is it. My life is over. But instead of giving Jonah what he deserves, judgment, punishment, death, what God does instead is make a profit out of him. Spoiler alert, in chapter 4, God will use Jonah to bring thousands of people to repentance. Isn't that just like our God? Saul the persecutor, God turns into Paul the apostle. Jacob, the dishonest trickster, God turns into Israel, the father of a nation. Moses the murderer, God turns into Moses the lawgiver. Simon, the impulsive one, God turns into Peter, the steady rock. There's a word for this in the New Testament. It's called grace. That's the only explanation for what happens here. This deliberately disobedient, utterly defiant runaway, lying half conscious in a pool of fish vomit, will, in the hands of God, become a prophet who brings repentance and salvation to thousands of people. To adapt Frederick Beekner, when Jonah had every reason to expect God to say, boy, are you going to get it? What God says instead is, I want you on my side. Which is what God says to you. And me. This is Jonah's best moment in the entire story. The moment that he realizes his only hope is God's grace. He knows that he doesn't deserve to be delivered from his prison in the deep. <clears throat> but he asks anyway, knowing or at least hoping that God will be gracious. And he promises that if God will deliver him, he will become thankful and faithful and obedient. Crisis has a way of doing that, doesn't it? Of driving us toward God. Of causing us to make decisions that we should have made long ago. In an odd sort of way, It's easiest to hope in God when God is our only hope. 
It's easiest to obey God when we have little choice. In his book, Wind and Fire, Bruce Larson tells about almost drowning in the Gulf of Mexico. He doesn't say how he became separated from his boat. He only said that it was the result of, quote, my own stupidity, something not uncommon for me. Sort of sounds like Jonah and me and you sometimes. Bruce said, I was being washed out to sea when the word of the Lord came to me and saved my life. What I thought I heard God say was, Larson, I'm here and you're not coming home as soon as you think. Can you tread water? Bruce said it simply hadn't occurred to him, but that's what he did. He treaded water until someone came along to help. And then here's the key sentence. He writes, If I had continued my frantic effort to swim to shore, I would have exhausted my strength and gone down. In how many situations have we made things worse by continuing our frantic efforts to save ourselves when all the while God was saying, be still, wait on me, depend on me? At least Jonah does that. In Luke 13, Jesus says in so many words that the crises that come upon us in this life are not sent by God, but crisis does come. So if we haven't realized it already, we should let those difficult days cause us to realize our need for God. This is the other lesson that Jonah teaches us. If we are in the pit, God's grace is our best hope. But much better still is not to wait until we are in the pit to recognize our need for God. In a generation gone by, there was an old farmer whose three bachelor sons still lived at home. They never went to church or had any use for God. The pastor and other people in the church had reached out to them, but they disdained anything connected to faith. Then one day, the oldest son was bitten by a rattlesnake. They called the doctor who treated the bite, but they were still very worried. Feeling a sense of desperation, they called the pastor. He arrived and was apprised of the situation And then he prayed this prayer. O wise and righteous God, we thank thee for the rattlesnake which has bit this oldest son. He has never even acknowledged thy existence. And we pray that this experience will lead him to repentance and salvation. And we pray for more snakes to bite the other brothers and a really big one to bite the old man. Because one snake has done more to turn them to thee than all of our efforts in all of these years. Amen. A not very serious story with a very serious point. We shouldn't wait until we are bitten by a snake or swallowed by a fish or taken critically ill or whatever the crisis may be. We shouldn't wait for a crisis to recognize that we need God. Not just in emergencies and dilemmas, but in every moment of every day. In other words, we should trust God in any and all circumstances. That's how the Apostle Paul puts it in Philippians 4. In fact, he uses that exact phrase 
in any and all circumstances. Paul echoes there what Jesus says in Luke 13, that every life has ups and downs, highs and lows, good times and bad times. Like Jonah, we are tempted to think that we know better than God knows. We are tempted to go in the direction we want rather than in the direction God wants. So here's what it boils down to. When the direction is not one we want, when the plan is not one we understand, when the outcome is not one we desire, will we trust God anyway? Isn't that what Jesus prays in Gethsemane? This cup, this plan, this outcome is not what I want, but I trust in you and I choose your will. Jill Briscoe, the Christian writer and speaker, tells of a time when her life was not going in the direction she wanted, and God was not doing what she wanted. She writes, I went and sat beside a little lake near where I live, and I prayed, God, I cannot see you working. What about all of these prayers people are praying? This is a terrible situation. What are you doing about it? God said, Jill, any fish in that lake? I looked at the lake whose surface was as smooth as glass. And I said, sure, of course there are. How do you know, Jill? Do you have to see a fish jump to know that they're there? I remember sitting for a long time until I could say to God, if I never see a fish jump, I will believe that they're there and they're active. If I never see you do what I happen to want, I will believe and trust in you. Would you pray together with me? Gracious, loving God, this morning we confess how easy it is for us to think that we know best, <laughs> that we know better than you do. Remind us again that your will can always be trusted, not only because of your wisdom, but especially because of your love. Help us to believe in you and trust in you. Amen. God's word is always invitation to the people of God. If God has been moving in your life in this service or in these days in a way that you would like to have conversation, prayer with someone on our ministry team, we would love to have that opportunity. In the meantime, I invite you to use this hymn of commitment as an opportunity to pray or sing in a way that will strengthen your personal relationship with Jesus Christ as Dr. Lewis Walker comes to lead us as we sing. My faithfulness up to thee is in the reverse of part of your bulletin. Stand as you are able and sing.
would you hear the benediction. And now in the name of God, the Creator, who has given us life, in the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son, who has redeemed us by His love, in the name of God's Holy Spirit, who pours grace into our lives in all of its ups and downs, go from this place to be God's people and to do God's work. Amen.